Good evening. Welcome to the Political Studies Association and British Library Lecture Series. Um, we have four of these a year. Um, we're very excited tonight about uh, the two people that we have uh, in conversation. Uh, let me tell you just a moment about the Political Science at Political Studies Association. You can go on our website and join. One of the things that you would get as a member is the um, magazine that we produce, Political Insight, and that is uh, produced uh, four times a year now. You will see them around. If you haven't picked one up, we've got extra copies uh, for you tonight so that you can see what you're missing. But generally speaking, the Political Studies Association is an academic learning society for those of us in higher education that teach politics. We also service uh, and provide we've got a lot of resources for um, uh, those teaching A-level politics and history as well. We have, as a learned society, a remit to um, also reach out to an external audience. And this is one of the activities that we do, to reach an external audience and provide information, excitement, entertainment, and we hope you get all of those things tonight. I want to tell you just a moment about Professor Ch Sarah Childs, who is uh, a professor at Birkbeck, but is also a member of the Political S uh, Studies Association. Um, professor Sarah Childs wrote... Uh, a very informative report uh, called The Good Parliament that I would highly recommend that you go and read, particularly if you're interested in gender and politics. Her current research is on a book called Feminism, uh, Feminist Democratic Representation. Tonight, um, our speaker was uh, possibly going to be detained uh, in the house, and so we were a little bit concerned about that. <laughs> Uh, but I said, no, 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 don't worry about that, because the only other person on the planet that knows more about gender in Parliament <laughs> besides a woman MP is Sarah Child. So we're very it's happy true. to welcome them both. And I will let Sarah introduce our, uh, our great and exciting guest. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, and uh, we look forward to the great questions that you're going to be asking. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Angie. I was going to say, actually, you're quite ordinary. And the reason why I say that is because sure. if we want more women in politics, if we want a more diverse politics, then we want ordinary people to be doing politics ordinarily and making politics something that it isn't extraordinary. So I say that with the greatest respect in all sorts of ways. Um, I will, of course, uh, let you know that Jess is... Labour MP for Birmingham Yardley and has been in the House since 2015. It feels like you've been there a lot longer. Forever. From my perspective, does it feel like that from yours yeah, as well? Yeah, it, it feels like a lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> I think that tells you something about how some people acclimatise and perhaps some people don't to the House, and I think that's a good thing. And I'm sure over the evening we'll, we'll talk a lot about being uncomfortable and maybe how we uh, discombobulate others in the House. Jess's background, many of you, I imagine, would know, comes from uh, the women's aid and refuge tradition, a strong, strong interest that she brings with her into Parliament on violence against women, domestic violence. And again, I think that's very um, illustrative of some of the concerns we might have about what politics does, what politics is felt to be about, and why we might want different kinds of people in our politics. So clearly... Um, Jess is here to, to talk about her experiences of getting into politics, of being in politics, of doing politics, and of course to talk about her book. I had this awful fear on Monday morning, one of those kind of return to school moments where I suddenly thought, bloody hell, she might have written another book and I'm thinking about this one. She assures me she might write a second one in the future, mm -hmm. but we're here to, to really, I think, explore that, that sense of who should be in our politics, who does get into our politics, and how do we transform the politicians that the people who make up our political class. We might just want to make that a little bit different. So that's the introduction I want to give you. You can do the Wikipedia, you can do the Parliament stuff. I'm not going to give you Don't leave it all on Wikipedia. That's true. There's some crazy stuff. Have you ever been tempted to do your own Wikipedia? Edit it myself yeah. from within Parliament. You know that there's a site you can go to and it tells you who has edited it from within Parliament because it knows the IP addresses and it will ping, this has been edited from Parliament. So no. Okay, so Although we... I know how to make a VPN. We could. So, so we could, so we could, could. take bets about who might change yours. Uh, I could think of a few, actually. <laughs> um, your kids, have they ever been tempted to sort of get on it? Uh, 
I don't... Uh, you don't they're, know... They're not you... really interested in me in that way. <laughs> they, I don't think they look me up on Wikipedia. I'm not one of uh, the Avengers ensemble. So, <laughs> until I am, I don't think that okay. they're looking me up. I think that's quite healthy too. Probably. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to... What we're going to do is I'm going to start with a few reflections on some of the uh, contributions that I think are really fascinating in, in, in Jess's book. And what I, what I really like about the open book, that it, it really opens hard, right? There is no gentle, let me try and persuade you to like me and like my book. It's basically saying, right, let me tell you why people try and shut people like me up. And I think that that's a challenge, I think, to, to many of the readers. And you talk about the ways in which um, women are shushed, right? We can be shushed. We can be pigeonholed. We can be told that we're just attention-seeking. I love this one. We can be threatened. So this book really blasts open with a critique of those who try to make women silent. So you're going on the offensive mm -hmm. kind of straight off. And I wonder, really, in all sorts of ways, why you wanted to start the book like that. I mean, I think it's quite compelling to... I mean, A, I had written that bit. I was cross. I always write best <laughs> when I'm angry about something. I can't... Like, I couldn't be a writer who somebody said, oh, you know, could you give me a thousand words on, like, marzipan? Uh, I would just be like, <laughs> oh, no. I have to be really angry to write something, um, usually. Um, and I had already written that bit of the book completely in a moment of anger. So th that was basically the first chapter of the book, which is the sort of the many things that people say to you to try and make you be silent or to, to delegitimise your voice if they think your voice is cutting through. Um, I, had I had just written it down in a moment of anger. Um, I had started to just make this list. So when somebody approached me and said, do you want to write a book? I was like, oh, look, I have this thing that I've already <laughs> written. And that is what got me the book deal, the, 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 the bit where I was upset. And I felt like that had to be the opener rather than it being about me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't want to write a autobiography, as it were. I mean, I'm, I'm, when I wrote it, I was 34, and <laughs> um, I'd been in Parliament for like a year and a half. So I'm not, I'm not in the territory of uh, writing an autobiography. Um, and but I, so I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it mm -hmm. to be about women in Parliament and and women generally. This isn't just about. Yeah. The, the shushing and the eye rolling and the trying to shut you up. And, and the, wor the very worst thing is the calling you an attention seeker. Women will frequently be called an attention seeker. So and in a way that my male colleagues, it never, ever happens to them. So if I go on the telly and I'm talking about housing policy, people will be like, oh, look at you on the telly again. You're such an attention seeker. And no one ever says... Oh, that Jeremy Corbyn, he's only in it for the attention. <laughs> you know, they're not like David Cameron, oh, just it wasn't loved enough and he just wants the attention. Mm. No one ever says that about male co my yeah. male colleagues. And I, I wanted to, I, it gets thrown at me literally every day. So I, I was really cross when I wrote it and I wanted to sort of splurge out about that. But also, the, yeah, the pigeonholing thing, because if you care about women, you're ultimately, you're pigeonholed because it's such a narrow thing to care about women because we don't have health or houses or wealth or education. We, we, we are only over half the population, so I understand it is a very niche... Yeah. It's a very niche field. And so, yeah, in the book, I, was, I say that no-one ever said that Andy Burnham only cared about football crowds because he <laughs> championed Hillsborough for years and years. No-one ever says George Osborne, always going on about maths and numbers <laughs> today. But if your interest is women, you are... Oh, you want to watch... And it was people who love me who said that. My, my dad actually said it to me, and my dad raised me to be the way that I am. He said, oh, you want to watch out? Yeah. They, they don't just get stuck with the old women thing. I was like... <laughs> I'm all right with that, thanks, actually. <laughs> you want to watch out, you don't get stuck yeah. with the patriarchy. <laughs> I've just sort of told of two things. I watched The Bodyguard because I was doing this with Jess. I haven't seen it. I've seen the original Bodyguard. <laughs> Kevin Costner. I haven't seen that one. Oh, my God. But she... How are you? Uh, I mean... Let's okay, this is not that. about me. 
where were you in the 90s? I mean, I've said it a hundred times. I was probably working really hard on my It's PhD. not good, but it is also bad. <laughs> okay, like Saturday night has just been fixed, but yeah. I'm going to watch it. Okay. Huh? Can you get it on Netflix? Okay. So the way, now I'm going to lose my train of thought. <laughs> so in The Bodyguard, she gets accused of, again, seeking power. So that's how, you know, so, so you hear it again amongst MPs. It's in the fiction. Yeah. But it's also, I thought, it happens in the academy too, right? If you do gender and politics, you get accused of being narrow. And you, I wrote, the one bit in your book where you're critical of kind of universities is where you're critical of political science because it doesn't well, do what you, you so are, she is. Yeah. So I thought I had to, I, at some point yeah. I have to get this in and you've given me the line right at the beginning. <laughs> and actually what I was thinking was politics in the universities has changed too now, actually, that we're increasingly talking about things that we wouldn't have yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I just want to put that in there very early on. Yeah, no, actually, but I, I, yeah, I mean... I, I, I wanted to study politics. I wanted to study politics at A level, but my school didn't do it. Yep. Uh, and um, the boys' school next door did do it. So my mum made a demand that I do my A levels at the boys' school, and they refused to let me. So I wasn't allowed because I was a woman to study politics A level. Um, and then when I went to university, I, I took politics, um, and I hated it. Yeah. Uh, so maybe only apologize, those sexist teachers in uh, my secondary school were right to not let me study it. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I hated, I, I hated it because it didn't seem to be about normal people to me. It was about um, basically old white men and what they thought about things a hundred years ago, and I didn't care what they thought particularly. <laughs> Or, or wanted to give it as much attention. So I stopped and I changed to social policy, which was about welfare for single mums and about housing and about the things that I understood um, to be the politics that I yeah. knew about. But I like to think that it's changed now and that I could have, like... Well, I was expecting, like, the women's room. I was expecting, like, <laughs> boutique wall hangings and incense <laughs> and for, like, you know, people to be, like, talking to me about big ideas about women and uh, society. It's just a load of public school boys who all voted Tory sitting around talking about John Stuart Mill. Yeah, my classes are not like I'm that. Out. <laughs> my class... Well, of course, John Stuart Mill is very important in the history of, of women's course. suffrage, of course. I mean, just... <laughs> I just feel a bit obliged to say that. Um, but, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. And I, th I think politics has transformed quite, quite substantially. Although, again, I was told, for, or told off for reading too narrowly. And I said, I haven't read narrowly. I just happened to have read deeply on a thing you didn't think was terribly important. Yeah. So, again, it does tie in with this idea about what's OK to be considered as the political. And, and you're right, this book is not a sort of a, a guidebook to what it's like to be in the House of Commons. It's very much about that interface between the everyday and the normal and what goes on around people and how we get that into those decision-making places in our institutions in all sorts of ways. So it is a critique of what I would call masculinised politics, but it's also about, I think, a claim for the politics of the everyday and, and for being women who have opinions and views and how we get those, those addressed. But I think you do make the link that you need the connections, that we can't and we shouldn't turn our back on those institutions and say we'll do a different kind of politics somewhere else, but actually you want to take your politics in there. So yeah. I guess I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more about, yeah. about that. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I could... Arguably, I changed more directly in people's lives when I worked at Women's Aid. Yeah. And it is this push and pull of whether my... And I had a a very political job at Women's Aid by the end. I had worked my way up from um, being in sort of the support team to being the person who was in charge of the strategy for development of the organisation. I worked every day with the Home Office, with the Ministry of Justice, with the, the department, um, whatever it's called now, housing. It's got a housing in it, DCLG. I can't keep up with what <laughs> we're calling it this week. Um, and... I was influencing politicians in policy around domestic abuse, human trafficking, sexual violence. And I really, really loved my job. And I definitely changed lots of people's lives directly through starting new projects and developing new things, but also changed government policy about what was good and bad. And so actually, I think that sometimes having been to Parliament now, it it sometimes feel like it is still very distant from reality mm -hmm. and did I change more then? But the reason I've 
stood in the end was because the thing that I really cared about, uh, the commissioning of services for vulnerable women, it was being done horrendously badly and bad decisions were being made in welfare, in housing, in, in mainly government funding to local councils. So I, first of all, I was like, well, I've got to change this, so I have to get onto the local council because then I can become the person who does the commissioning, um, which I did. And then mm -hmm. I found that you can't commission if you've got zero pounds. Uh, so, uh, and Birmingham City has, I mean, three billion less than zero pounds. So um, I thought, well, okay, then now I have to take it to the next level and I have to, I, basically wanted to just keep getting onto the right side of the table. Once I found the barrier, I thought, okay, I've got to keep going and keep going up the chain until I ended up in Parliament, so where I definitely have been able to change <coughs> some policy. But it is entirely rooted in the reality of people's lives that I wanted to go there. And I, it, it is very, very different to doing that politics at a... Uh, local level um, at um, a different institutional level than being in Parliament. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be different. I am now in the same meetings, actually, with the same civil servants <laughs> um, as I have been for 15 years talking about the same things. They just have to pretend they don't agree with me sometimes now because I am a member of the opposition. And the only thing that's changed is the minister. <laughs> so I'm a constant, the civil servants are a constant, and we've been talking about all the different things for, for many years. And I, I just, I thought that if Parliament is, has people who actually know what they're talking about on certain practical issues, mm -hmm. that that would be a good thing. <laughs> um, so... It is hard, though, because it is a bizarre institution, and trying to re retain normality. So I rang where I used to work last Christmas and was like, can I do a shift in refuge? Because I feel like I'm losing yeah. my skills and my knowledge base. Um, I think Parliament massively de-skills people, and um, I think it's important to try and make the institution of Parliament much more normal. Careful, you'll tempt me to, to start advocating for um, MPs job share where you could do your job so I'm not, on a uh, job share and do your, do your refuge work I'm against days. it I know she is. <laughs> I'd end up doing all the work. <laughs> Some other bugger would just do nothing and then maybe not. It'd have to be another woman. But I think, I think that, that concern you have about bringing the, kind of the real life into Parliament is, is very much about challenging that idea of the public and the private spheres, that there are things that are not political that happen and that there are people who belong in certain kind of spheres and others who do big P politics. Yeah. And it's really challenging that. But when you were describing those meetings where you said, well, well the same kind of people are still there. So what, what has to change then? Because if you couldn't effect change mm. as a policy operative, and you're struggling sometimes to convince them as a member of the opposition, is it just about being in government or is it that... I mean, I think it would help <laughs> to change things. <laughs> Uh, Labour governments, I think, tend to be better. At that. Obviously, that's why I think that, that's why I'm a <laughs> member of the Labour Party, although only just. Um, <laughs> the um, the I, I think that the the difference is is that people listen to your voice yeah. when you're there. It is. Parliament is nothing more than an enormous loud hailer. And if you use that loud hailer well, you can have real power. So I am a, a member of the opposition. I don't have the power to actually hold a budget and say this, this, this and this has to be funded. And that, you know, is hopefully not always going to be the case. But I do have an enormous voice. And having a big voice means the government of the day, especially if you have a voice that knows what it is talking about, and they definitely don't. Um, so that, and they, they do know about lots of things they don't know about this. And so that is a very powerful tool to have. And I just say the things in Parliament that I have been saying in the pub all my life, mm -hmm. but now people listen. So that is the difference, is that... Essentially, it's like a media platform where your ideas can reach a critical mass of people enough to convince them that then they scare the government. And in a way, is that kind of offensive? That your, that your, your 
views and your positions are the same, you've been saying the same, but you're now only taken seriously because of your position? Or is that a good thing about democratic representative government, that you should be taken more seriously as an elected member than you would have been as, a, as an expert? Yeah. I mean, yes, it, it is offensive. The most offensive thing, actually, about being a member of Parliament with a voice is when, for example, you have a little old lady in your constituency and she, her boiler is broken and she has rung the council 700 times and no one comes out and I ring the council and her boiler gets fixed. It is not right. I don't, I wasn't raised, I, I don't have the political ideology to believe that I am any better than anyone else. I mean, that's not true, actually. I'm definitely better than quite a few people. <laughs> well, come on to that. Uh, but anyway, um, but, you know, like... In a hierarchy. <laughs> it's not like all things bright and beautiful. I believe that everybody yeah. has um, a right to have their voice heard. And I really, really, really believe in that sort of citizen politics, citizen journalism. Um, and so that is very, very annoying, actually, that now, when, when I was a learned expert on something it was very, very hard to cut through. When you're slightly controversial as a member of parliament, you can, you get your voice heard. It's not right, but I am a pragmatist and I fight the war I have, not the war I want. And I would dance with the devil to help women and children be safer um, and more liberated. And so I just have to put up with the fact, but th that system definitely does need to change whereby experts and just evidence evidence based I, I don't believe that all policy should yeah. be done in a sort of evidence some of it is your heart some of it is because you know deep down that even if the sums don't add up or that that you know that we've got to do this x y and z because it's the right thing to do and it might cost loads of money and it might do nothing for the tax taken so I'm, I'm not advocating entirely evidence but but it would be nice if sometimes they use some evidence rather than ideology to make a decision the welfare reforms is being the perfect example is that anyone with half a brain could have seen that the welfare reforms are short-term saving long-term agony and expense anyone in the sector if they'd asked us and they did and then they ignored us we said don't do this this is a ridiculous idea and they did it anyway they and now we have to go through this massive dance around refuge funding for example where we finally win but it's like well that's six years of uncertainty for that sector when we've been telling you from the beginning just listen to us because you don't know what you're talking about and so I think there needs to be a, a mixture of both. So, yeah, I, I hope that in the future, governments don't... You'd have to get experts involved in the manifesto writing, though, wouldn't you, much more beforehand? Yeah. Because once you've said it, you are sort of stuck with it. Although, mind you, they change their minds all the time. <laughs> Lie. How confident are you about the, 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 um, the domestic violence bill and the legislation this year and... Um, I don't want. I don't want a cheap point. I, I mean, no, I, you know, no. Um, sort of... I am optimistic that we have come so far as to get our own bill, um, and I feel really pleased that a specific piece of legislation around domestic abuse is like a really bold step forward, actually, for people like me who've campaigned for many years on the issue. Um, and many for many, many, many decades before me. Um, but legislation does nothing. I think that Parliament forgets a lot of the time that the laws that we write are only as good as how they are implemented. So you can have amazing legislation about uh, domestic abuse, the brilliant coercive control mm -hmm. legislation. It really is you know, really heartening now that it isn't just bruises and cuts that mean you've been abused. It is gaslighting, it is aggression, it is financial um, exploitation. That that has all been included in a piece of legislation. About 12 people have gone to prison for it since then. It's meaningless. It's just words on goat skin unless you spend the time putting effort into implementation and that costs money. So my view about the domestic violence bill is it will basically be a tool for ministers to stand up and say, look how much we care about domestic abuse, but it probably won't change the lives of that many women in refuge. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in changing the lives of women in refuge, not just 
making governments tick a box. And at the moment, I worry that unless it comes with a massive budget, you know, I'm talking levels of giving the DWP, giving you your votes, that level of funding, unless it comes with that, it will just be nice words on goat skin. So we'll see. Okay, thank you. I want to um, link that, that, that kind of passionate advocacy and a real demand for substantive change, not just symbolic change, as, as important as though that can be sometimes to, to signal that Parliament is addressing concerns that 30, 50 years ago it wouldn't have seen as being what it should be even talking about, to this idea of different bodies in the institution. Mm. And I'm not, I don't want to have anything so simplistic that sort of says you can, you know, these issues will only ever be introduced by certain kinds of people with certain kinds of bodies. But you talk in the book a lot about the kind of, or the varied experiences of women in politics. You know, you talk about Theresa May's shoes. You talk about, you know, a fellow uh, MP talking to you about her sense of being judged for how she looks and how she performs. We've had the discussion of the dancing last week um, by Theresa. I mean, all of this stuff, and, and you kind of link it. Everyone looks a dick when they dance. Yes. <laughs> I mean, she looked especially bad, but it, you know, why, yeah. why was that that massive story that it was? It's ridiculous. And so you've got those very, very clear examples of individual women who are public and who are engaging in formal electoral politics. And at the same time, you've also got stories in the book or accounts in the book of both yourself sort of becoming um, internally focused, being prepared to sort of give everything up for a boyfriend you had at the time. Yeah. And you talk, and I think quite, um, in one of, those, one of those lines where you, where you kind of shiver slightly about this young girl who thinks that having a cheap boob job is going to give her confidence. And, and in a way, I want to connect those two sets of observations about how we find women in politics and in public life being problematised for what they look like, what they do, how they sort of comport, comport themselves and compose themselves and how they speak, and that young girl. Because if we don't transform the confidence and the abilities of those, those young girls, we won't have the next generation. And I think there's a, there's a link between those. And I, I, I think I would like to hear your thoughts on how you see those connections and how do we transform those young girls so that they're not looking for ways of building up their confidence that might, at least for some people, think you know, maybe not the best way of, of trying to acquire confidence. Why is it that we, we worry about girls and confidence? What are we doing to those young women that make them lack the confidence? Mm. I mean, unfortunately, the answer is bleak because it is really hard because in every single aspect of our lives the, the the patriarchy and I don't say that like you know I'm not like angry will and that I hate men is that we live in a patriarchal system and we don't even notice it anymore that we don't even notice all of the things that make us behave in a certain way all of the social um, ticks and norms that make that made me a woman who was raised by strident feminists to be a strident feminist was always told that I was you know fit for great things and that I should never ever let anyone tell me otherwise immediately when it at the first opportunity mm-hmm. I became somebody who thought that my role was for boys to fancy me, for boys to be impressed that I'd bothered to um, learn the lyrics of all the songs (laughs) that they liked and watched Vietnam films. No girls like those films. The bodyguard, We are lying when we (laughs) pretend that we like Apocalypse Now. It is boring. Uh, At best, that's the best review I can give it. Um, But I did all of those things. I allowed my sense of who I was to be not it wasn't even a boy asking me to do that or it was just that I basically felt that I had to 
um, conf not even, it wasn't even conscious. It's not conscious. I just thought, well, the boys like that. I better like you know pretend to w like watching skate videos. So I'll just watch loads of skate videos and I'll get to know everything that there is to know about skate videos, so I can talk about it with total fluency. Do you think that the boys were writing down <laughs> the lyrics to take that <laughs> and thinking, or do you think that the boys were thinking, I've really got to get the back catalogue of like you know sixteen candles and uh, <laughs> and dirty dancing so that I can confidently say nobody puts baby be in a corner so that a girl will like me. <laughs> no boy ever did that. And at the very first opportunity, uh, when I had a boyfriend, I was willing to give up going to university because I, lived, I moved out of home and I was living with him and he had some difficulties and I just thought, well, it's my responsibility to do what he wants. And he didn't want to do anything, but that was the better alternative to the things that I wanted to do and I was willing to do that. And I think that if that happened to me and I didn't realise what was happening to me until many, many, many years later, I didn't think, I thought that I was choosing those things, but I was choosing them from one option. The only option I felt that I'd ever been given as a woman. I mean, my family were really really like proper woke before anyone knew what that meant <laughs> like you know they are ridiculous it's like almost painful how guardian reading yogurt knitting my family <laughs> was i mean my dad brewed his own beer and had a beard and now he'd be considered to be a hipster <laughs> but back then he just looked like the man from the joy of sex uh <laughs> which we used to repeatedly say to him all the time um and <laughs> I mean, stunningly like this man. In fact, I've then no married Googling. a man who looks a bit like the man from the Joy of Sex. Google it for the younger people in the room. I meant Google your dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but still, my mum would, my dad would do all the cooking and then my mum would serve up the dinner to us and I was the, the only other girl in the house uh, other than my mum. And she would give me less food than the boys. And... I remember one Christmas uh, when I was like 18, my dad sitting down and we were all sat around and um, he was like, oh, shall we have a whiskey? And he poured the boys all a whiskey. And I was like, what the fuck am I, chopped liver? <laughs> um, and, and he didn't, it wouldn't even occur. So even yeah. in those tiny cues in your life where it is mum who serves us while the men sit at the table, it is... You know, the women, we have less because if we didn't have less, the boys would be hungry because they're boys and they're growing and they need to eat. And, and there was bloody loads of them in my family. Um, <laughs> and so to change how we feel about the confidence of women and to stop women politicians feeling like they have to dress a certain way and look a certain way or deport in a certain way... It's all part of the same thing where women are given a list of rules that men just don't have. And until we can change it everywhere, the way we, our media needs to change, we need uh, advertising needs to change, the way uh, that women are presented. I mean, the fact that in every single TV drama, I mean, actually, The Bodyguard is a good example, I believe. I mean, I literally haven't seen it. Of um, the, the, And The Other Bodyguard is an example of where it went wrong. <laughs> is that, you know, Whitney Houston is much fitter than Kevin Costner <laughs> and much younger than Kevin Costner in that film. <laughs> yet it's perfectly acceptable for a 22-year-old woman to be cast alongside... A 50-year-old bloke. That is, we see that literally all the time. And Keely Hawes, uh, you know, they are le level pegging in the fitness. Yep. So that's that's good. Um, <laughs> and age. I actually think she's older than him. So, and that, you, you just, it's noteworthy because it never, ever happens. So that's what we have to change is that we have become used to all accepting that we live in a patriarchal society. And how you change that in Parliament. I mean, I will go about changing it by wearing trainers to uh, Parliament and wearing whatever the hell I like and not having to feel like I have to... So did you, do you wear them in the chamber? I have worn them in the chamber twice today. Um, yep, I always See, that, wear that's trainers. That's a change, right? That, they, they would have been unparliamentary five years ago. Fuck Absolutely it. Absolutely sure. Uh, <laughs> is what I say to that. 
Um, I don't, uh, I mean, I sometimes, yeah, yesterday, like a tiny, like tied, I mean, I still wore trainers, but like I wore a white shirt and tried to look a bit smart because it was first day back at school. <laughs> um, but then, you know, I don't live in London. I can't be having fancy clothes all over the place <laughs> that I can't remember where this half of that suit is or that half because I've got two houses. I know that's first world problems. Um, but... Yeah, I, I just think we need more people to be brave enough to be normal. And it is really hard in Parliament, and it's easy for me to say, be brave enough to be normal, because, um, you know, I, I understand that the press will hound you if you say something even slightly wrong. So politicians have a script and they behave a certain way and they <laughs> pretend that they love to go to Cornwall rather than Mallorca on holiday because we've got to, <laughs> you know, all that sort of thing. I actually really like Cornwall. I'm not slagging up Cornwall. <laughs> um, but, you know, they do these things that they've been told politicians do and mostly they're male things. So women politicians have to fit a mould to protect themselves yeah. in reality. And teenage girls, fit of mould to protect themselves. So we've got to transform we've those got to trans molds. Yeah. I think the earrings do it. I mean, I, I, I really want, I like to have the idea of watching the men in the room when you walk in with these great, huge kind of gold hoops sort of dis Sometimes I go to events and there's women just with gold hoops and red lipstick on. They're like, I want these because of you. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, so glad, trashy 50p gold hoops are my thing. Because it's really accessible. Anyone could own these earrings. You could be destitute <laughs> and buy a pair of 50p gold earrings off the uh, market. Actually, in Parliament, it's the men, some of the men, at least some of the men, I don't want to do big grand statements, they do think women get a get an easier ride with the clothing, actually. It is, well, it's true. Yeah. That's the only thing in Parliament that women <laughs> are better off than men, is that we can wear what we like, yeah. really. Most people don't. They still like, will wear a sh shift dress, jacket combo. Uh, shift dress in bright colour, black yes. jacket. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, at least the, we've lost the scarves and the brooches. That kind of 80s oh, politing is slightly... Yeah, although uh, Penny Morden, she sometimes wears a massive brooch and I've like, got loads of respect for the confidence of wearing, but like a brooch like this big. <laughs> I love her brooches. Um, and she's in charge of women and equalities now, so, so I've got to cosy up to her and her brooches. Um, are, her bro are her brooches political in the way that Madeleine Albright's are? No, I don't. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's a oh. hidden political message in what looked there's like some a great chandelier. studies of Madeleine Albright. <laughs> Yeah, you, yeah, you need to, yeah, you And need the to Queen, look. didn't she go a bit yeah. political on the old brooches? When she met Donald Trump, she wore the one that Barack Obama had bought her. Yeah. <laughs> Cheeky. There is, uh, there is a politics of women's fashion in, in um, the political world that, that really does. But the men do have to yeah. work. They have to wait for permission to take their, um, their jackets off and all that stupid stuff. Um, none of us are allowed to wear hats. Something about hats, there's some rule about... I don't know what that is, but it's like basically you're a murderer if you wear a hat in Parliament or something. It's some ridiculous. But the rules thing. have changed in the last couple of years. Because that was one, yeah, that was one of ours. That was one of ours, yeah. Me and Sarah were on a committee with the Speaker <laughs> where we try and make things better in Parliament. And they're the very first ever one my children were in Parliament and they genuinely asked the Speaker if that they could have a soft play in the middle of the chamber. <laughs> He was quite up for it, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. But one of the things we changed was we said that men didn't have to wear ties anymore. And there was such outcry, wasn't there? There was one Tory MP who said, I won't take any interventions yeah. from people who aren't wearing a tie. <laughs> oh, it's just like, you're an idiot, man. Yeah. <laughs> and again, if you, if you, if you have to wear this, a certain kind of uniform, it's not going to connect to men who don't have those kind of clothing or men who don't think that the only people who we should take seriously are men who wear ties. My right? husband has literally worn a twi tie twice at my mum's funeral and on our wedding day. That meaning what, he's an engineer, what, what why is he wearing a tie? Mm -hmm. He's wearing dirty boots and yeah. cargo pants. It goes pants. back to your point about who do we think of who has the expertise and experiences that we need to listen to and if you're dressed in a certain kind of way, it's... it's it's going to narrow who we think of yeah, as the people yeah, yeah. who should be feeding into our policy making. So I, I want to just move a bit more sharply onto getting more women into Parliament. And you, you talk about two men in this book, Chris Grayling and Philip Davis. I will be very neutral at this point. <laughs> so Grayling, Chris Grayling, you, you name check in the context of triggering standing for election. He's yep. your touchstone. He is. Can you tell me why this makes... It's just... 
got the wit and charm of an amazing <laughs> man. No, uh, it's because he is exactly the opposite. Um, he, when Chris Grayling was the Minister of Justice, um, I think he may have been the first ever person to be given the job of Minister of Justice who didn't have a degree in law. And so it was sort of noteworthy. And then he went on, I don't think it matters whether you've got a degree in law necessarily, but he did then go on to be the worst Minister of Justice the nation has ever seen. Um, and he went through a model of privatising the um, probation service. Now, at the time, the women's aid where I was working, we had diversified and we had uh, recognising that around 90% of women who end up in prison are um, have been victims of domestic and sexual abuse, uh, thanks to the brilliant Baroness Corston, a <laughs> Labour woman, um, who did huge pieces of research on that. So we had set up, recognising that lots of our women ended up in the criminal justice system, um, we'd set up a female offenders service that was we was commissioned by probation and worked very closely with probation. So we were sort of knee deep in the changes um, and taking part in lots of Ministry of Justice um, events where they were going around consulting with experts to then ignore them. Um, and I went to an event about the privatisation and Chris Grayling spoke and then the head civil servants of the National Offender Management Service were there and we were talking about how this would work on a payment by results model, um, whereby if people re-offended, the private companies would, it would, take, would lose the money in the contract. And I asked some really, really basic questions about how that contract would work because people don't live locally to the prisons. Local prisons, that isn't a thing. It's not like the Yorkshire Ripper can only go to prison in Yorkshire. He's in Broadmoor, that's not in Yorkshire. So it, like, they basically were working on the premise that when people came out of prison and would be in probation, they would stay living in the exact same area. And I was just like, have, like you're running the Ministry of Justice. Have you ever met a person? <laughs> have you ever spoken to anyone who's ever been in prison? Do you know anything about prisons? And they knew so little that I thought, he got to be the uh, top bloke in the Ministry of Justice and he knows nothing, I could definitely be a Member of Parliament. If Chris Grayling can do it, anyone can. <laughs> so, I thought, I mean, and he's got still quite high office. He's the Transport Minister. Notice how the trains have stopped running. <laughs> Ridiculous. So, yeah, and so that's why Chris Grayling is my uh, inspiration because, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, if, if, if he can do it, I can be the leader of the free world. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say that, that, that you dared to think that you, you knew better, and, and I, I think that's a really powerful idea, and maybe that's what we need to instill in people, this idea that you can dare to think that you know better than some of the people. Yeah, because I genuinely have, <laughs> I, I had like a class thing as well, where yeah. I would go to these meetings with these civil servants and I would think, oh, you know, I've got to impress them. I would feel like I had to impress these people to get them to listen to our side of the story. And then I thought, why am I trying to impress you? You don't know anything about this thing that I am a genuine expert in. And I, I think that there's a huge problem, especially in women, but also a definite class thing where people don't have intellectual confidence. Yeah. And they don't write down the brilliant idea because they're like, oh, I'm just not sure whether it is brilliant. Chris Grayling writes down 10 shit ideas every day. <laughs> and he doesn't go, oh, I'm not sure about this one. <laughs> it might be brilliant, it might not be brilliant. I'll just write it down anyway. <laughs> uh, he, you know, and that, that is a worry. Like, believing that you're brilliant as a woman as well, it makes you seem big headed. Mm -hmm. but I am better than Chris Grayling. That is just a fact. It's like an empirical fact that you could study and you would definitely find that I was better than Chris Grayley at everything. I think I'm, I'm going to move on. <laughs> I know. That, that's, uh... But I'm going to move on to Philip Davis. And I'm going to, and the reason in the, in the book that I think this is interesting is that you, you, you discuss Philip Davies in the context of all women shortlists, so quotas for women in politics, and this idea of merit. And, and the all women shortlist comes up a number of times, and, I, and I'm going to talk about it in a number of times too. But here you speak of it because you suggest that it, that it reveals his own, you know, mediocrity. 
Um, and I think I kind of want some help from you actually on this mm. one because politics and gender scholars have tried really hard to defeat the argument about merit, that if you get selected on a quota, you are as good as the men who didn't get selected on a quota because it's not called a quota and all of those kind of things. And how do we break through this idea that women don't have merit? When we've got this, we've got the evidence that says actually they're very experienced, they're often very highly educated. I mean, globally, women are often more educated women than members of parliament, formally. Mm. They've got the credentials. They might not necessarily have the same backgrounds, but sometimes they do, and sometimes they're better ones. But we can't <coughs> seem to defeat the attitudes of someone like Philip Davis, who just says any kind of system that enables women to participate is because they don't have merit in themselves. How do we, how do we get beyond that? I mean, first of all, your basic premise is wrong. You shouldn't try and convince Philip Davis. <laughs> we, we, we should stop singing to the people who hate us. And, and social media has been an absolutely brilliant, time-wasting exercise of trying to convince people who don't want to be convinced. Uh, Philip Davis is not our constituency. He's never going to agree with us uh, on, on these matters. So we shouldn't bother to try. In the same way, I'm never going to agree with him on his his views about, you know, well, anything. Um, he's that, quite good that, for racing tips. But that general view, that, that kind of, um, that concern about quotas, I mean, it is still there in the Labour Party, yeah. right? There are people in the Labour Party. Oh, God, Party. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's, he's, it's not just Philip Davis. I mean, the, the whole meritocracy argument is very, very hard to, um, it is very hard not to do it because you immediately get angry and also a bit defensive. But I suppose what I always say when people um, ask me if... Uh, you know, that they don't agree with quotas. And lots of people say it to me, mainly conservative women are toying with it all the time. And so they need a bit of, this is my constituency now, because if I want to improve um, pol women in politics, I, you know, I, somebody's got to be doing something over that side of the fence as well, because they are half the people, more than half the people in parliament. And I have to believe that wanting women in Parliament means wanting not just women like me in Parliament, if I genuinely believe in diversity. So I have to try and convince them all the time that it's a good idea. And when they say, oh, you know, but it's just not the best person for the job. I mean, I do sometimes give them direct examples of, you know, like them versus Chris Grayling is always a helpful <laughs> one. Um, and uh, but. I always say, if you believe that the best person always gets the job in the current system, you must believe by that virtue that men are absolutely brilliant financiers and white men are just, they, they, they understand money and finance and the law and they are definitely the best people for the jobs. And black women are just cracking at cleaning. <laughs> if you think that always the right person gets the right job, why is it that all cleaning jobs are done by black women and all finance jobs are done by white men? Are you telling me that you think that is entirely based on merit and that you believe that one group of people is literally born to clean, the best cleaners ever, cleaning A-class standard? And, and, and people find that very uncomfortable. They say, well, of course I don't. I, you know, of course yeah. I don't feel like that. Well, so, well that's... That's the system we've got at the moment, so do you not think that maybe we need to try and do something to change it? But also, I mean, all the evidence of the women in Parliament is that they were better qualified, more educated, et cetera, et cetera, uh -huh. than the men who were in there. The truth is, is that it's a sexist, patriarchal system, and it's very hard to get people to recognise that, especially people who have never suffered the injustice themselves. And I think that feminists, feminist scholars, feminist activists need to, we need to find a way of getting people who have not ever been oppressed to understand what oppression mm -hmm. feels like. Because as soon as you try and describe it, you basically sound like, you know, when you try and describe a dream and it's slipping away from you literally <laughs> as it's coming out. It, like when I try and explain it to my husband, when I'm annoyed with something that he might have done or said or thought, I just immediately sound like I'm totally overreacting because it's it's really small microaggressions mm -hmm. and it's like you know I just feel like an idiot for being worried about the fact that in my gym in your gym in the toilets there's a high-heeled shoes in the toilets and and why should women have to look at pictures of high-heeled shoes but you immediately sound like that's not one of the you know there's bombs <laughs> being dropped on people 
you'll live in your changing room with a picture of a shoe. It's really hard to explain to people who've never suffered any sort of oppression why what it feels like to be oppressed and exploited. And it's one of the reasons that men's rights... I mean, men's rights activism in the UK has a terrible name because it is mainly run by people who dress up as Spider-Man and shimmy up the side of <laughs> Buckingham Palace. And it's built, it's built on the basis not of getting men more rights, it's built on the basis of hating women. So it's a poor place to start. Um, but we need a really good men's rights activism mm -hmm. and activist base from the grassroots in the UK to do things like fight for equal paternity rights for men and women. Because at the moment, men are getting a terrible deal why is there not the same <laughs> grassroots movement for that, that women fought to have the maternity rights that they have? And it's because the massive constituent that we need to fight for it don't know how to do organised fighting in the same way because they've never been oppressed. They, they feel like they've got it all right. So we need to get find a way of teaching people about how to rise up and use some of the models of the women's movement but for for men and trying to express how it feels to be oppressed because you're never going to get quotas or rebalancing or any sort of equalities to be believed by anyone who hasn't or can't empathize with the idea that things are a bit shitter for some people They've also got to be prepared to give up their power and their privilege. Oh, right? yeah. Some of them might not actually do want to. No, no, no. It's absolutely that they don't want to. I mean, look yeah. at the Labour Party. That is exactly the problem. There's a reason the Labour Party has never had a female leader is because it would mean somebody literally stepping backwards. It would mean that every... that the ambitious men who say how much they believe in female talent and feminism actually saying, on this occasion, do you know what? I'm not going to stand, and that won't happen ever in a million years. Um, and that, that's the problem, is that for some people, uh, equalising means that they will lose a bit of their power and they don't want to give it up. I wouldn't want to give it up, but we've got to, we've got to understand how to smooth that. Oh, it's, isn't that shit, isn't it? It's that a typical woman thing to say. <laughs> That's true, yeah. That I've help. got to help them understand that they shouldn't have all the sweets. <laughs> because the sweet... Oh, darling. It's like with my kids. You know you have to share with each other. Now you've got four and he's only got three. So I'll take one and then we'll all have the same. That is... I mean, but that... Everything ends up being on the, the shoulders of feminists to solve every bloody problem. Gosh. I think at that point... <laughs> Really annoyed. I think at this point I should stop indulging myself and being selfish and um, let you participate in this conversation with Jess about the ideas that generated this book and I think really inform what she's doing in this institution that in so many ways does want to shut her up, does want to constrain her and doesn't want to necessarily give over the power that she wants to claim from those she doesn't think should have quite as much. So I believe the lights will go up at this point. Oh, hello, you look all lovely. So if I can have a show of some hands, and I will take a good selection. I'm going to start with woman, young woman down here, I think. And I'm going to do this side for a three, and then I'll come to you. We'll, we'll do one question at a time to begin with, I think, if that's OK. Mm. If you could say who you are, that's always um, nice. I'm Daisy, and I was just wondering, um, how much do you think feminism and women's rights have evolved over the last 100 years, and how much do you think they're going to, like, get better over the next hundred years and like because I think at the moment there's a lot of stuff about feminism being like man-hating and what I think about that is that how has feminism like got to a point where it's so much about men now <laughs> because like and it's about like man-hating. I mean it, ha it, it so hasn't evolved Daisy because they've been saying that line to shut us up for decades so... Mm -hmm. So, like, how do you think... Um, also, what really encouraged you to become a passionate feminist? Like, was there a moment in your life when you realised, like, this is, like, bad and...? Mm. Um, I'll answer the second bit first. Uh, there wasn't a moment in my life. I was all... I was... Re I, I mean, I went to playgroup, uh, to Women's Liberation Playgroup was the name of my <laughs> playgroup that I went to which was run by a group of women from the Labour Party. There was no organised childcare when I was a kid. 
And so this group of women from the Labour Party uh, basically got a church hall. It still exists, this nursery, actually, but now I think it's got proper regulations. <laughs> Not like then. <laughs> Jesus, they'd let anything go. Um, and basically they took it in turns to, uh, ha to staff it for the day and look after the local kids for the day so that the women could go and work. Um, and so they would get part-time jobs and they would always make sure that they could do one day. So the Women's Liberation Play Group, uh, where I lived. So, you know, I was, I was groomed to feminism um, <laughs> all my life. Um, and it wasn't like a... It was never presented as being like... I, never, I didn't read like loads of feminist books when I was a kid or anything. Um, it was just the way that we lived our lives. My dad and mum were equal in their roles for looking after the kids and earning money. My mum earned much more than my dad by the time I was a teenager. Um, and so it, it was just sort of a way of life. I, I didn't feel angry, actually, so much. I, I knew from a very early age that people would try and say that I wasn't as good as my brothers at things and so that I had to try and be better. I always felt like I had to try and be really, really the best because otherwise I would never, ever be able to achieve what they have achieved. And in some cases, that's not that much. Um, but um, the moment where it changed for me, really, and I realised all of the different things that had happened to me as a woman that I'd just taken for granted as being part of life, a bit like the whole Me Too movement, was when I was working at Women's Aid, I got the job there, and it is a life-changing place to work because you realise for the first time that being a woman is mortally dangerous, that just by the very virtue of the chromosome you were born with, you are more likely to be killed by your partner. You are more likely to be raped. You are much more likely to be sold into slavery or exploited by somebody you trusted and loved. And when you realise... I didn't, I didn't feel unsafe. I mean, I did some pretty risky things when I was a teenager um, that now I realise were bad. Um, but I didn't ever feel unsafe. And when I started working at Women's Aid, I realised that being a woman is a terrible risk. Uh, and that then made me, like, that changed it, and that meant that I was going to actively work to change that. That was the thing that made me... When you meet somebody who's been shackled under a table, being fed scraps from a fridge and is forced to have sex with 18 people every day for no pay, you get pretty cross that that could happen to your people. Um, and so I decided I had to change it. And so it was Women's Aid was the thing that changed me. And also, when you work at Women's Aid, unlike Parliament, everybody's a woman. Uh, and um, the, the camaraderie, the sisterhood, the sorority of most organisations in the voluntary sector, but really Women's Aid is about the empowerment of all the staff and the client group. So it's really like happy place. Now, the 100 years, I think feminism is pretty much exactly the same as it was 100 years ago. Um, and while progress has been made, I'm afraid to say that I imagine feminism will be the same in 100 years because we won't be there yet. We won't be liberated to the level that I would... Uh, and I'm going to leave instructions on death for when I... <laughs> But what will be acceptable that we can stop it now and just accept that we are equal? Um, but I don't. I think that the the the, the men hating thing is exactly like the things in the first chapter of my book. It is just the simplest way to shut you up. It is the simplest way to say what you're saying doesn't matter. It is a trope, it is stupid, and it works. And that's why people do it, is because it works. And it's really easy to remember. And so my sons sometimes say to me, do you really not like men? I read it on the internet. And I'm like that, well, I don't like you very much now, Fortnite <laughs> overspender. Um, but... Um, I, you know, it, it's simple and it's effective. It, like any political campaigning strategy, simple like take back control and make America great again. Simple one line things that swipe the legs off your opponent's arguments are 
it's much harder to win an argument with like real thought and nuance than it is to just do that. So don't, you know, don't ever let anyone say that you just hate men. The best retort I ever saw for somebody saying that I hate men was a woman who I'd gone to school with, I haven't spoken to her since we left school, put on Twitter, that's not what it said about her on the toilets at school. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another woman by the pillar there and then I've got some more I've got lots Hello Sandra Lorman uh, what made you change your mind and go to university? Uh, my mum <laughs> basically threatening to kill me over and over again um, <laughs> I, uh, in the summer before I was going to make the decision, I went up to university because I wasn't intending on staying in student accommodation um, because originally the plan might have been that we would go together, that he would come with me because, like I say, he had nothing going on. Um, and um, we looked around some flats that we might have been able to afford because we, we couldn't have lived in student accommodation. And it was so grotty and so horrible because uh, we could barely afford anything. We were, you know, 17. Uh, he was a bit older, but only a bit. Um, and he's another job, so we couldn't really afford to look at anywhere nice. And it was really, really grotty and really, really depressing. And that was the point when he said, I'm not going to come to university, which I, I, don't, I can't blame him. <laughs> I'm not going to come away with you because, I'll, you know, my life would be awful here. You'd just be going off and doing this. Um, and so he came back and then I was sort of like, oh, OK, then, well, maybe I'll defer for a year and I'll go to Birmingham University. It wasn't sort of like I was going to give up any idea of going to university at all. Uh, I thought maybe I'll defer and go to Birmingham University um, so that he can stay in Birmingham. And my mum basically came round to see me and was just like, this would just be such a monumental mistake. And she, it took a, a couple of months for her to convince me that I should continue to consider going away uh to, maybe she just wanted rid of me now on <laughs> reflection um but and also in that in that time I did ha I had started to notice that maybe you know he was I mean he used to cheat on me all the time for example and I once caught him on the back before the days of Facebook you know when when we couldn't just stalk people endlessly uh I, I, on the website photos of a nightclub in Birmingham I saw him snogging some girl um and so then I I think at that point I was like a bit like well you actually maybe I didn't didn't leave him of course I carried on going out with him for another two years um but I gave in to the idea that I would go away but I just came home every weekend is the truth I'd never spent any time at university there. I, I lived in Birmingham and basically... I lived my life like I live it now. I commuted to Leeds. Can we go up to the back middle? Somebody I can't quite see in a darkish top. And then I'll come to this side because I realise you are getting ignored terribly. Hi, Jess. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask you... Um, you, you've, uh, there's been a lot of tweets recently about anti-Semitism, and in mm. one of them, you said, women, we seem to be conveniently forgetting that issue too. Yeah. Um, obviously in relation to the Labour Party. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm a Labour councillor, and I'm speaking oh, as a Labour councillor who's been told things like, we don't do gender. And uh, when I give my view on things, I've often been told, it's not about you. Um, so... Uh, I want to hear what you meant a bit more in that tweet. Mm. Can you tell me a bit more about that, please? I mean, it's potentially libelous, but yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's not libelous, actually. That's a joke. Uh, it's specifically about the um, accusations around the, one of the NEC members um, who there's been, you know lots of accusations about him having a very poor attitude towards anti-Semitism, but there was also reporting in the media about him having an incredibly bad attitude towards women. And uh, on this particular occasion, I know some of the women involved, and I am basically the Labour Party's referral point for all sexism and sexual harassment, and in fact much worse, and tomorrow I shall go to Wandsworth Police Station to take part in a sexual assault case where I was the first responder and give my evidence. So I hear an awful lot of stories 
um, the worst side of politics in every political party. That's not just the Labour Party. Um, and um, people are... In the factional fight in the Labour Party at, that is going on at the moment, people around this particular man, people are either saying, of course he's fine, he's not an anti-Semite, he should be allowed to think anything, and then the other side are saying, no, he's not, he's an anti-Semite. And then that is the fight that's going on. Nobody seems to give a toss that were three women who came forward and said that he had basically humiliated them in meetings, had talked about how being mates with Jeremy meant that young girls wanted to do selfies with him. Nobody seems to care that he'd said those things. Uh, and it is always, sexism is always the thing that we tolerate more than we tolerate anything else. You can make a perfectly sexist jo joke in the House of Commons and nobody will bat an eyelid. If you made a racist joke, you would end up in trouble. I mean, you'd only just have to go away for a couple of months and then they'd let you back in. Um, but, you know, it's totally acceptable to be sexist, to be casually sexist all the time, and nobody cares. And the Labour Party doesn't care about this bloke, even though some of the things, the comments that he uh, is reported to having said were in the NEC meeting, the meeting of our executive of our political party allowed not just casual sexism but overt sexism in the meeting what hope have we got to try and change policy for ordinary women in the labor party and ordinary women in the country if we can't even stand up in our own meetings and say do you know what mate you're totally out of order you're out <laughs> I mean, one of the messages of the book is about calling out everything, yeah. right? And, and that's how you respond to the kind of criticism that you get as a young woman. You just yeah. call them out. You just have to call them out. I've got a question from a lady in a striped jumper, and then I'll go behind. Thank you for a wonderful <laughs> talk. Oh, you're welcome. Um, what can we do about women who are members of parliament who buy into many of the things mm. you object to and I object to, mm. but who sort of follow in the lineup with all the men and uh, kowtow and... Mm. Yeah. Is there anything we can do about them? And I won't name any names. <laughs> um, it, it's really, really hard. And a, a bit like the anti-Semitism row in the Labour Party is that, like, the, the side that says there isn't any anti-Semitism keep pulling out Jewish people to say, look, here's a Jewish person and they don't think there's any anti-Semitism. Like, you know, I could find loads of women who don't agree with me and think that there is no need for feminism anymore. I mean, open the Daily Mail. Um, it's full of women writing that they hate women. And um, the, the, in Parliament, there is definitely, there's two sorts of problem that you're talking about. There is the absolutely overt... Um, which is much more common on the Tory side, but not exclusively, but it is much more common. The very overt, stop this talking about women's things, we're going to, we're, we're all, we're jolly on our all equal footing, and if you talk about it, they'll, those chaps won't want us here anymore, so we're going to carry on and, you know, stop your moaning, don't ask for maternity leave, don't, you know, we'll crack on. And it's just, you know, there is quite a lot of that. And trying to, ch that, but that is changing, I have to say, there is much, much less of that, actually, in reality. One of the reasons being is because of quite a lot of the sons of the women's movement are now in Parliament mm. and they are having babies and they are saying, I want to be at home looking at, after my babies <laughs> as well. On, on both sides, that is. Um, and so some of those women who felt that it was their duty to basically, like Mrs Thatcher, be the anti-feminist. Um, there is, le there is less of that. But again, I think that you just, what you have to do in Parliament and in politics is just focus on the people you can, you can change. Um, and there is definitely more of them. Um, but the other group of people, and this makes me even sadder, that is the alarm that I wake up to in the morning, so I'm now <laughs> feeling like anxious about being late. Um, the other group of people, and... Um, I think actually this presents itself much more in the Labour Party, is women who... <laughs> it's all right, don't worry. That's happened to every, all of us. Uh, if you get, you get fined in the House of Commons. Oh, no, 
<laughs> um, the, uh, the, is the group of women who talk a good game and are like, yeah, I'm totally feminist, I'm this, that and the other, and bow to left-wing men. That happens a lot. And because... Uh, a left-wing man who they respect has said something, not necessarily overtly sexist, but that has forgotten about a whole category of women. They, they don't, they don't, they only speak up against the other side's sexism or sexual harassment. They don't speak up about it when it's within, and that I think is really, really, really hard. You've got if you believe in sorority, you've got to believe that women you don't like deserve protecting too. And that that is hard, uh, I think. I think that sometimes it's like, I mean, oh, I meant better things for women that are like me and think like me. And that, I think, is hard. I want to take two questions because we're running out of time on this side. So I've got one woman there and I'm going to go towards the back. Sorry, I'll be, I'm going to be really brief in my answers now. Um, I would, no. hi. Um, I'd like to ask about <laughs> online abuse and do you think Labour can or will curb online abuse? And also quickly about the gender and anti-Semitism thing. It does seem really noticeable that the women who speak about anti-Semitism, like Luciana Berger and yeah. um, Margaret Hodge, like, do seem to get a very different level of abuse oh, to more. the men. And as a Jewish woman who speaks about these issues, it's so clear that it, it's, it's also gendered. It's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally is. Um, the anti-Semitism thing is totally been gendered and the women, I mean, Ivan Lewis, he, he has spoken out against it. He's a Jewish man. He has not had anything near what Luciana has. I mean, Luciana has seen four people put in prison for anti-Semitic abuse against her. So it definitely exists, people. It's not made up by uh, the Jewish lobby. Um, the, uh, you're, so you're, you're absolutely right about that. The online abuse, whether Labour will stop it. Labour, no, the Labour Party is not Google, it is not Twitter. It, it can't stop people behaving in a certain way online. It could show much, much more clarity over um, the worst offenders. It could... Jeremy Corbyn could stand like Sadiq Khan did. Sadiq Khan... Stood in front of the press and the, the world's media and read out loads of the abuse that he had. Now, Jeremy Corbyn could stand and read out the abuse that his supporters, his alleged supporters, I don't know, you know, anyone can put a hashtag, uh, and his alleged supporters are sending to Luciana. He could stand there and read this and say, This is not in my name, this is despicable. But, and I think that would be really, really, really strong. It wouldn't stop it though. There is no way. The ball is rolling, people. We, you know, Pandora's box is open. People are going to tell me that they think I'm ugly, fat, and that they hate me, and that I should shut up, and that my children must cry themselves to sleep every night because they have me as a mom, and much worse stuff about my children. Um, the Labour Party can't stop it, but the Labour Party can stop being a massively hostile environment. Okay, we'll take the last question. No, sorry, but there's a woman right in front of the glasses, sorry. I'm sorry I have to be so arbitrary. Hi. Uh, thanks for a great evening, it's been really informative. Um, you made some really interesting comments about culture in the House of Commons, but you mm -hmm. also talked about your experience doing policy work and meeting with civil servants. Um, and I guess I just wondered if you had any thoughts about whether the culture of the civil service, the kind of narrowness of experience, is also an issue. <laughs> and if that's kind of more well, or less minute. urgent than parliament, I guess, and uh, both from a gender but also class perspective, which I think is a, a, yeah, a challenge. Class is the biggest challenge, actually. I think gender, with the argument, is sort of one, because also when you have a 50-50 split, um, whereas, of course, class in the broadest terms, no one actually defines themselves as any particular class anymore apart from people who are trying to make a point. People who live in my constituency don't feel, you know, they're not walking around saying, I'm really working class or anything. They're just, I'm, I'm Susie. They, they, they don't <laughs> define like that. Um, but um, class is a much, much, much bigger group even of that and still the tiny fraction of people are represented in both the civil service and in politics. Uh, generally. Um, the civil service has a long way to go. It's actually better on women than it used to be. But, no, I mean, it's got... 
I'm, this is going to sound really ageist. Uh, I sit sometimes in meetings with ministers, with people who are clearly just straight out of university, and they're sort of like going like that to the minister when you say things, and I'm just like, what the fuck do you know about anything? <laughs> is what I feel like saying. And I, I, I don't think the model of people ending up in the civil service where it is like the fast track, the fast stream, is necessarily... It's not bad, and you need some of that, but... I think that there's got to be a much broader uh, funnel into it, uh, pipeline into the civil service, as well as <coughs> politics generally. Class is definitely the biggest issue. And the thing about class, the Labour Party will sit and say this as well, the current uh, sort of model of getting more people involved in, in politics, is they will talk about class. And when they talk about class, very often what they're talking about is men. And they forget that women are also working class. Uh, and all the markers of things that, uh, the way that, that we monitor it and things are all around different sorts of employment that almost exclusively forget care work and the working class jobs that women do. Um, so, I, you know, we have to be really, really careful when we open the door of saying we need more people from down the pit in Parliament. I mean, actually, it's probably more minors in there than most of the jobs. <laughs> um, um, but... You know, we have to be really, really careful that the class thing doesn't forget about the intersection of both race and gender. OK, I'm being told I have to yeah, sorry, cut, I'm stop. afraid. Um, thank you for just a wonderful evening. Of oh, course. you're welcome. But I, I'd like to thank them because they had really good questions. They and did. Sometimes you don't always get good questions, I know. Right? None of so... you did that really annoying thing where you just, like, said something for, like, an hour <laughs> <laughs> and didn't even ask a question. <laughs> All said what you expected them yeah, to say. Yeah, this is not Labour Party conference, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't be on the stage, would you? No, I certainly <laughs> wouldn't. I'm not even going. <laughs> so if I can thank Jess on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the Political Studies Association for both being in Parliament but also speaking to us in such a, I think, direct and honest manner, which we, we, we do expect from a woman who has 50p earrings. <laughs> thank right. you very much. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.